Good morning. Good morning. So I'm Hilary Baker. I'm the Vice President for Information Technology, and I am here to officially welcome you to our tech fair here today. It is great to see a full room yet again. It is um, absolutely wonderful year by year. And uh, once again, we have a cross-section of our campus community here. In addition to IT, we have representatives from all of the divisions and uh, almost all of the colleges and many of the auxiliaries too, so thank you. In addition to our two speakers, we have eight of our CSUN technology vendors here today. I hope, and I saw some of you um, with them at the back of the room, they will be available over the lunchtime hour too, so um, I hope you get a chance to stop by uh, all of the eight. And I also want to highlight, and I know some of you, I saw some of you using it, that we um, have a virtual reality experience um, down front here. So if you missed that already, do stop by at lunchtime. We um, are really looking at virtual and augmented reality uh, in terms of the educational aspects. We know that we're seeing more about that with entertainment, with medicine, and there are real um, growing educational applications. And uh, Dion Zell and her team, um, along with Jake, en Jake Enfield from AMC, um, faculty member there, are really working with faculty some during the summer and then again into the fall to really explore what these new technologies, emerging technologies, are really going to mean for our education and what it might mean for us um, at CSUN with our teaching and learning. So it's great to experience it, both the virtual reality and then also see the difference between that and augmented reality. We are at CSUN thinking of having the term VAR for virtual and augmented reality to be sort of all-inclusive um, because although they're very different, we're exploring them together. So wanted to let you know that. Last year at uh, this event, I mentioned AppJam, um, which is our CSUN student mobile app competition. And I shared uh, and showed you all the winning video uh, that was called Matador Patrol. And it would allow students and employees to use their mobile app to connect with the Department of Police Services to request a member of the Matador Patrol uh, group to walk um, um, them across campus. So I wanted to give you an update um, because since then we've had a group of IT staff and uh, significantly IT student um, uh, developers working with us in IT, uh, along with the Department of Police Services, to develop that Matador Patrol app. And it will be available to all of our students uh, later this fall. I was just talking to the chief. She's about to see some of the final testing of that. And once we have it ready to go, it'll be rolled out. But it's pretty exciting to be able to see our students come up with a great idea and be able to come back around and, uh, and deliver. So uh, this earlier this year, I hope many of you attended the uh, App Jam that we held last semester. We had double the number of student entries this last year, and the winning App Jam student team app was called Find It. And I wanted to show you their winning entry. Steve is a freshman starting his first day at CSUN. Steve doesn't know his way around campus and struggles to find his classroom. Steve ends up lost at a pond. Exhausted, he sits down on a bench and notices a phone on the ground loaded with Find It. He signs in. A map appears, showing his location. He presses the search button and enters microwave. He picks a location and begins walking. Finally, Steve can heat up his food. He continues his journey as he enjoys his lunch. Suddenly, he sees a great landmark. He takes out his phone, sees his location, and finds a scavenger hunt. 
He reads the riddle, Among the Sierra Nevada, and accepts the challenge. Steve finally reaches the roof of Sierra Hall, and upon pressing check, he solves the riddle. Navigating campus will never be the same. Find it lets you search locations added by the community. Create finds by clicking the add button, selecting a category, and writing a description. To create a scavenger hunt, add a start pin, end pin, and a clue. Solve the hunt by going to the location, pressing the treasure checker, and discovering a new location or hidden reward. Find It allows the community to share their knowledge, building a map of locations and resources you never knew existed. Find It. Know your campus. Yeah, I think, I think they're not here but today, but uh, we were really pleased um, and excited this year to, in addition to providing um, monetary reward um, as for the winning uh, AppGem winners, we also provided them with uh, startup consulting services through both uh, Lacey at CSUN and with the LA Chamber Bixel Exchange. And this particular group of students uh, have worked particularly with Bixel and did some additional discovery interviews and research and decided to refocus their app around student organizations and activities very specifically. And they're now developing a meetup app where the on-campus groups can organize and promote meetings across campus connecting students with activities and organizations. Um, we're still in touch, obviously, with Bixel and the students, and um, understood as of yesterday that the students plan to release a prototype of that app um, this particular fall. So um, we'll be following along with that. Lastly, I just want to say that you all know that it takes a lot of people to arrange an organize, uh, a, a day like this today. And it's been led by Ben Quillian. Uh, yet again, he's our leader of this each year. And the core planning team includes Marla Joseph, Dominic Little, Keith Holland, Monica Sweeney, Jeannie Chen, Celine Venezuela, Julie Arandondo, and Ryan Kolog. Please join me in thanking these great IT employees along with our speakers and the vendors today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ben to introduce our first speaker. Thanks again. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Quillian, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Information Technology, and I want to welcome you along with Hillary to today. Um, I'm also very pleased to have the honor to introduce our first speaker, Morley Winograd. Morley is an author and speaker who specializes in providing insights into millennials. His predictions and analysis have appeared on or in the New York Times, the Today Show, CNN, USA Today, the PBS NewsHour, and many others. He is the co-author with Michael D. Hayes of three highly acclaimed books, Millennial Majority, Millennial Momentum, and Millennial Makeover. Morley is also a senior fellow at the USC Annenberg School Center on Communication Leadership and Policy, and he also served as the executive director of the Center for Telecommunications Management in USC's Marshall School of Business. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome Morley Winograd. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was here earlier for a different event on this campus, which I know faculty at and other things. But recently, in the course of doing not CSUN related stuff, I banged up my knee. So you're going to see me sit for much of this presentation. And hopefully, that won't be too distracting. Are we ready to go? Yeah, I think so. Give it a second here. Here we are. OK. Um, and so I'm great. I'm delighted to be back in uh, Matador territory again. The um, subject of millennials is something that I've been researching and uh, writing about for almost a decade. 
Uh, if you noticed when I came up here, I'm not a millennial. Um, but uh, my co-author and I were fascinated by what we could see coming in this step chart towards demographic destiny that's in front of you. It portrays the rate at which millennials will become adults over 18 and the proportion of the population that they will be. So when we started writing a decade ago, uh, only 20% or so of the population was, uh, adult population were millennials. But today, they're about a third of all American adults. By the end of the decade, they will be more than one in three. And they, we haven't seen a, a generation of that size uh, since the baby boomers. And we knew that the baby boomers had completely changed America. And we decided to figure out in advance what this generation might do to this country this time around. It's all in the books. We'll cover a little bit of it today. But, you know, they're moving out of the college-going population, so we're also going to talk about the generation that comes after millennials, who we call pluralists. But before we get into all that generational stuff, I do need to see if you guys are ready to make the uh, insightful observations that generational research requires. And because we're on campus, we have therefore created a little test for you to start. Uh, it contains its own instructions. I won't repeat them. And I'll see how, we'll see how good you are. Keep track of your score. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? No! So, how many of you saw the moonwalking bear? Okay. The point of that little video, originally produced in London to make sure people watched out for bicyclists, um, is to make, it, make all of you understand that the purpose of today's, my talk today, is to help you see the moonwalking bear called generational differences. Because generational differences, unlike other kinds of distinctions in our population, race, ethnicity, uh, et cetera, are usually not noticed or observed. Most people don't see that moonwalking bear. And as a result, they run into challenges and issues which appear um, puzzling, at, at the very least. And so I hope that instead, by the time we're done and before we get to lunch, uh, we tell you enough about generations that you can recognize the generational uh, issue that's confronting you and be able to deal with it. What you do about a moonwalking bear is entirely up to you. Okay, so let's talk about, we are in an academic setting, let's talk about definitions before we talk about the subject matter. Uh, generations are, were defined by the guys who wrote, literally wrote the book on generations, that's what it was called, started the field of generational studies. Uh, William Strauss and Neil Howe, they were defined as a group of people uh, born over roughly a 20-year time span, although it does vary, uh, who share uh, common beliefs and an adherence or, a, or an understanding that they are members of that generation. They have beliefs and experiences that are shared, but they also have some allegiance to the generation. So, for instance, if I were to ask the folks in this room, how many of you are members of Generation X, what kind of response would I get in a hand raise? There's a couple. And now for you older folks, 
How many of you would relate to being baby boomers? Oh, yes, well, there you have it. Um, poor X always gets slighted, and boomers always make sure they know they're bigger and stronger. Um, and then I suspect, and I can obviously see, that we also have some millennials in the room, right? Now, when we started writing millennial books, nobody even knew what the word meant. We often heard people call them millenniums or something like that. Now you can barely open a newspaper or a, or a website commenting on and, not, and avoid finding comments about millennial generation, not just in the political season, which is how we started our writing, but in all aspects, including a continuous series in the New York Times Style magazine, which is known for its uh, caricature of millennials as well. So people know that, those are their, that there are generations out there, but they have either stereotypical or wildly inaccurate notions about these generations that we're going to try and talk about. The question, however, before we get into that, is why? Why would people born over a specific time period feel that allegiance, have similar beliefs and values and behaviors? What's going on? Well, there are three things that create generational behavioral differences. Uh, one of them is, in fact, the common experiences that they had growing up. Um, it obviously over a 20 year time span doesn't work exactly, but for instance, the distinction between boomers and Xers is that boomers can remember when John F. Kennedy was shot, they have a personal memory of it, and Xers know it happened, but, and it may have impacted their lives, but they have no personal memory of it. And so there are clearly some experiences which make a big difference in how people think about how the world works. Now, when I say how the world works, I'm talking about significant major paradigms or philosophical beliefs. You either believe that, for instance, people are successful in life because they were, because they were lucky, or you believe that they're successful in life because they work hard. It's kind of difficult to hold both of those positions and, and in the course of your life. And people come to those paradigms in the time period they're with you. That's why people are always talking about what your professors are talking about to the students. Because they know, psychologically, at the age of 17 to 24, uh, age of maturation, uh, is a time period in which people take the values and beliefs they got from their parents, which have an enormous impact on millennials and, will, and every generation, and we'll talk a little bit and have some fun with uh, millennial child-rearing behavior of parents, but it does vary by generation, and we'll talk about how it's changing with the generation that's about to arrive on your campus and why that change in parental upbringing approach, what that'll mean and the kinds of students you'll have, they take that kind of lessons learned from parents and family and friends, and they come here or somewhere in the course of their uh, late teens, early 20s life, and they experience things, and then they sort of reach their own conclusion. They could embrace their parents' ideas, they could reject them entirely, they could alter them, but they do that. And when they do that, in a, in a very similar way, you get generational behavior. Now, let me quickly add that this is not astrology. Who you are has nothing to do with the year in which you were born. Uh, and for those astrology believers here, I apologize, but it doesn't. And we are not saying that on an individual basis, if you know a person's generation, you know the person. That is wrong. This is a group behavior phenomenon, not an individual behavior. So please don't take anything I say here today personally about generations, personally. And also don't go out and say, okay, I understand how to run the world. All I gotta do is figure out what generation you belong to and how I can adjust to your behavior. What we are saying is that with survey research, which is the field of my co-author, 
and that kind of sociological studies, you can, in fact, see differences in behavior that are within a generational cohort. And uh, our contribution to the field is, in addition to what I just talked about, parents and, and uh, experiences, communication technology, something you all know a lot about, has a major influence, or at least has had a major influence, on generational change over the years. It is interesting, but there is a, about a 20-year cycle of technological change, particularly in communication technologies, from broadcast media to social media, et cetera. And those 20-year waves look like they come pretty close to the generational waves. And so we put together some research around all that, and we consider that the third reason why there are these generational changes. Now, the other thing I haven't mentioned and I'm now going to get into is there are actually four types of generations. There's four ways to raise kids, uh, and that tends to create, and there's, tends to create cycles, four different types of generations in 20 years or an 80-year cycle. So let's see what that looks like. These are the four archetypes of generations. They cycle through history over 80 years, which makes the ability to predict the future if you understand generational change much easier. That's what our books are about. And they are particularly relevant to English-speaking peoples and American history. So I'm going to show you some of that in specifics here. But just so you understand, if you start in the upper left-hand corner and civic, that is a generation interested in civic affairs, in the doings of government and institutions. And it is a type of generation, once upon a time, that was uh, called the GI generation. Born 1900, 1925, Tom Brokaw's greatest generation, grew up in the Great Depression, fought World War II, and then went on ahead to create the modern institutions that we live with today that you can watch if you want to Netflix Mad Men anytime you want. And that civic generation, after it comes an adaptive generation, I belong to that adaptive generation after the GI generation. You've never heard of it. It's called the silent generation with very good reason. And then after that came a generation some of you belong to and are even willing to admit it, a generation that's not interested in adapting, it's interested in disrupting. Its disruption is based upon a strongly felt sense of ideals and idealism. And the most recent one of that, which I suspect you recognize now, is baby boomers. And after a idealist generation comes a generation called reactive, different types of that, but a reactive generation reacts against the turmoil that an idealist generation creates, and that is today's Generation X. So I've shown you up there, and you can read it if you like, the details of that history I just covered, recent history of generations. This stuff goes all the way back to the founding uh, uh, of our country. Uh, the people who were most instrumental in writing the Constitution and the system of government that we had were members of that civic generation. In history, they're known as the Republican generation. They include people you may have heard of, like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, even before he was a musical. So that kind of cycle happens all the time. In Generations X's case, uh, we had, they grew up in a time of great turmoil. And the parental style in which they were raised was mostly benign neglect. I'm not saying you didn't have good parents. I'm just saying they had other things to do. We had rampant inflation. Women had to get out of the household and become a second income in order to family to held itself together. Women had new freedom through the advances of the pill and the other reproductive sciences. And so we began to see what we, we are, com, feels normal to us now, which is this gender equality movement and there wasn't anybody home. So we had something that we'd never seen in America before 
called Latchkey Kids. Now, I didn't get many hands on Gen X, so I don't know if we have any Latchkey Kids here. Oh, I got quickly, yes, okay. These are children who wore a latchkey around their neck because when school was out and they came home, they had to open the door themselves and spend the time between the end of the workday, as the end of the school day and the end of the workday, on their own. And it, they did pretty good. But when they came up, that magazine article about Xers uh, was written by boomers and they were called slackers, and the subtitle on the magazine is about how they've got a tough act to follow because boomers are so terrific. But they actually did pretty well. However, as you can see, have made mostly alienated, individualistic, anti-institutional rhetoric, concern more about family and friends than anything else, because they, they missed the loving from their family, parents that they had when they were growing up, and very entrepreneurial. Because if you're left on your own devices when you're growing up, when you become adults, you become Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and make a lot of money. Uh, so that's Generation X. You don't have any students like that, but I'm sure you've got plenty of faculty. Here is how the country thought about children when Xers were growing up. <laughs> this, I mean, it's not a random sample. These are the popular movies of the year, right? <laughs> and the basic message over that time period was, children are basically the spawn of Satan. <laughs> and the less you have to do with them, the better off you are. Because the only thing wrong with the Davis baby is it's alive. Oh, great. Um, and you've seen recently some attempts to revive some of these uh, titles and plots. Uh, Rosemary's Baby sequel and some other things, remakes and all that. They flop because they have nothing to do with our attitudes towards children today, and they seem to be ridiculous. And in fact, in one of my lectures, after one of my lectures, I had somebody come up to me, a millennial, and said, you were joking about those movies, right? We didn't actually make movies like that and treat people, uh, children that way. No, I wasn't joking. Those are really where the country's uh, attitudes towards children were. And you can understand why Xers have the behaviors they do because they didn't exactly feel welcomed. So when they became parents, and also when the baby boomers, later baby boomers, had kids, people decided something completely different. The problems of society were clearly because we were neglecting our children. So let's take them from this level of status in society and let's put them up here and make them the whole focus of the world. And uh, I'll show you later, in case you've forgotten, the baby on board signs that announced, you can't get near my car because my baby is inside it. So that's quite a change, and those signs appeared in 1982 when the first millennials were born. And millennials were born by, were raised by parents who were convinced, psychological studies, other things, that the way to avoid, excuse me, the way to make their children successful was to build up their self-esteem as high as you could because the world was a tough world, a lot of hard knocks. They're going to need to feel good about themselves and believe strongly in themselves if they're going to be successful. And that's what every parent wants for their children is for them to be successful. And so we got the child rearing behavior that was drilled into me by my ex or kids. Don't ask me about my parenting. Um, when, I, when, we, when they had kids, when I had grandkids. And that was, whatever they did, be sure and tell them it was a nice job. And don't criticize what they did, because all you care about is for them to feel good about what they did. That's kind of the millennial parenting style. And it's an important element of the millennials, who grew up, as you can see from this news magazine cover, 
It's a news magazine that no longer exists, thanks to millennials. But anyway, this picture of millennials as young people is the exact opposite of the generational X picture I showed you. Now, they're not people standing around wearing black and looking past each other. These kids are dressed in bright clothes. They're hugging each other. Their underwear is hanging out. Everything is great, right? And we use those magazine covers because there's only 10 years between those two covers. There's 20 years of a generation, but there's only 10 years between those two covers. That's how quickly things changed. And as a result, we have our civic generation of millennials. And look what happened to the movies. Now, the child is, in fact, the center of the action and the solver of the problems. They're smarter than adults. The most important one there is Harry Potter, which is the millennial Bible. And if you don't believe me, go over to Universal Studios and watch them go through the Harry Potter thing. So the people running, running, Dumbledore, uh, running the university, Dumbledore and friends, those are the boomers. They talk a lot. They don't do much. They set rules that are impossible to follow. You can't trust them. That's millennials' picture of boomers in the, in the allegory of Harry Potter. Of course, if you're feeling bad about that, you could be an Xer, which is, well, I guess in the Harry Potter world, the name that cannot be said is actually an Xer. Those are the people who killed Harry Potter's parents. All right, so we have, we have this little group in Harry Potter of diverse friends who work together as a team and they encounter problems because of the rules of society and the evil that exists in it. And how do they fix those problems? They wave their magic wand. And that's what millennials do. When they encounter a problem, they tend to wave their magic wand, which you know today is a smartphone. OK. <laughs> so here are the seven traits of millennials. We talked about the baby on board sign and how special they are. And if you don't believe a millennials are special, ask any of them. They will tell you they are special. <laughs> they have been sheltered. They're a very important and precious resource. And so we have to protect them. And so we've had a wave of child protection legislation, amber alerts, and all those sorts of things. Uh, kids used to disappear and nobody cared. Now, thankfully, we all care, right? <laughs> And they're on milk cartons, and then we went on from there. Okay. But when we're talking sheltered, the photo down there is a picture of a millennial ready to go out in a dangerous stroll in the stroller, hence the head helmet and shoulder harness to protect them. I also told you about how my uh, kids told me to talk to my grandkids, which I do. Uh, to be sure they're raised as a confident, uh, full of self-esteem individual. And when you do that, when you tell kids from zero to 18, before they get here and you give them a real grade, uh, that whatever they did was great, right? They become very confident. And then they enter the society early on, things that ki we let kids do, like buy music, Napster, total disruption, or vote, elect Barack Obama, and suddenly they're really confident because it's proven that they've understood now that they can change the world if they work together. Okay, let's talk about Barney. <laughs> Barney contains a central message of how to behave that we've given through this generation. Uh, I've talked to a number of Xer parents when I put up the Barney sign. I used to actually hold up a purple dinosaur, but we went to bed. Um, they would admit that they sat their child in front of the television set to watch Barney when their child was growing up, their young millennial. They would also admit that as soon as the program went on, they ran out of the room because they couldn't stand the storyline, right? So Barney is a purple dinosaur, as different on the outside as he can be. But on the inside, he's just like you and me. And that's one of the messages that we drilled into this generation, that everybody is the same. We treat everybody equally. 
We don't tolerate intolerance. And in fact, the stories of Barney are a group of different types of kids, some would say politically correct group of friends. And they go out in the world and they encounter challenges. And the challenges are almost never physical challenges. They're almost always emotional feelings challenges. And the solution that ends every episode is one that Varney figures out that will work for everybody. Nobody's feelings are hurt at the end of the program. Everybody has found something good about the solution. In your business school, we call that a win-win solution, right? And that's what millennials are interested in. Boomers are basically interested in win-lose. We win, they lose, that's good, right? And you can hear some of that in the dialogue from some of our more notable boomer public figures. That's not where millennials are at. Millennials are into win-win. And that's where America's headed. Okay, there are seven of these. They are also a highly achieving generation on all, almost all of the social indices that we measure society's wellness. Millennials have taken the country to new highs, or in cases like bad things, new lows. So they don't drink as much, they don't smoke as much, they, they get good grades, they don't uh, uh, commit juvenile crime like everybody was so afraid of. Oh my God, now all these young people running around and they're all gonna behave like the Exer movies I showed you. No, none of that happened. A very, very, well-behaved generation that believes that social rules are important. They are in that sense a conventional generation, not a conservative generation, actually quite the opposite, but very conventional in how they think people ought to behave. And so in your classroom, you will find millennials willing to challenge faculty about the consequences of breaking the rules but never, as Xers did and Boomers did, about the need for rules. The Xer slogan is actually no rules. And for a while, Outback Steakhouse thought they'd get all the Xers by proclaiming there were no rules. Then they went into the restaurant, tried to order something that wasn't on the menu, and discovered there were rules. All right. So, so but, but millennials are only interested in the consequences of the rules, and they're very good very good about discussing, or you would say negotiating those consequences, because they've been working at it since they were three years old. When they misbehave, their parents would never physically discipline them. That's one of the rules of millennial upbringing. But instead, they would give them a time out. And the said, OK, you did that. And the consequences of doing that, like I told you, is a five minute time out. And the three-year-old would say, four minutes? And then the negotiations were on their way, right? OK. That's millennials. And let's see if, OK. Now let's talk about what comes after millennials. We call this generation the pluralist generation. It's not the only name it's known by. There's no commonly accepted name just yet. Uh, some people have called them Generation Z, which is because they come after Generation Y, which is millennials, which came after Generation X. All that's completely wrong. Every generation changes and shifts, and it's not XYZ in any way, shape, or form. We call them the pluralist generation because they are the most diverse generation, the most pluralistic generation that America has ever seen. In fact, the majority of this generation are not white. And that's the way births have been going for a couple years now in the United States. And when this generation, as it grows up and becomes adults, America will no longer be a predominantly white country. Many, many states are no longer predominantly white. In their population, student populations long ago, in public schools anyway, became majority non-white. But that's going to be the, the way America is in the future with this pluralist generation. And you can see that the time in which they were born, um, they are enthusiastic about their diversity. If you haven't noticed it, it is like something they don't, they don't obviously pay attention to the differences. Instead, they celebrate when people, when they get to meet people of different types and different things and can make them friends. And so that's that future generation for America. Now, the par parenting style has shifted. 
just as the millennial generation stopped being born, oh, excuse me, before I get there, just a few things on diversity. That's the scale of the diversity by generation, starting over at the far right with my silent generation, moving towards that pluralist generation. Uh, and you can see it's approaching, uh, uh, it, the rate of birth is declining, and the gr a degree of diversity is increasing across those two generations. Hopefully you can read that from wherever you are, I up there. And, um, and it's, it's an important demographic fact. Millennials are gonna be the largest generation for a foreseeable future. Birth rates decline beginning with the Great Recession and the start of the, that it greatly impacts and will cover the pluralist uh, time period. Um, and so they won't be as numerous, but they will still be an important adaptive generation because they, we hope they will hopefully help us adapt. That's what adaptive generations do. They take the disruptions caused by civic generations and institutional change, and they smooth out the differences. On the parenting side, which I was trying to get to. So new psychological studies have shown that self-esteem is not the key to success. Um, that, in fact, sometimes people filled with self-esteem don't operate in a real world because they're so self-confident that they miss things. And instead, a study of people who are leaders in their particular endeavor or enterprise and sector have shown that they all have a common personality characteristic in a large quantity. And that characteristic is known as grit. And if in your mind you think about the movie True Grit, you sh you've got it the ability to persist in the face of difficulty and to continue to strive to be successful even when things don't go well. That's the psychological definition of grit. And by the way, the young woman who's a, the hero of the True Grit movie is a member of her adaptive generation back in the 19th century. So what do you do if you want to raise a kid with lots of grit? Well, you don't tell them they did a good job if they, don't, if they fail. You instead tell them to try again. You don't reach out and show them how to solve the problem. You may give them some clues, depending on how old they are and the situation is over, but you let them learn from a young age that when something goes wrong, what you do is you try again until it goes right. And that's what grit is. And I'm sure you will all welcome such students here when they arrive here in another three, four, five years, members of the pluralist generation, who will have a much greater capacity for individual effort and striving than millennials do, who get their ability to succeed from the group, from working with the group. That's where their strength comes from. These kids are being raised to be more independent and more creative by their currently mostly extra generation parents and less dependable and less worried about keeping the group together with respect. That's what you can anticipate. Okay, so now we're gonna to turn to your world and, uh, and surveys of people who are either pluralists, remember they, they're not adults yet, or millennials or both. And I'm gonna see if I can, I'm gonna stand up and see if I can make sure I get you the numbers right from, which I can't do from my seat. So people did a survey of plurals only, not millennials, who are not yet in college, and asked them what they were, thought, what they thought about when thinking about going to college. 67% uh, says their number one concern was being able to afford it. And you see that concern on the part of their parents also uh, breaking out in this political conversation. And I guess I should do full disclosure, I'm the president of the Campaign for Free College Tuition as well. Okay, 72% want the flexibility to create their own college experience. Remember what I showed you on that creativity and you, you get through life by figuring things out and doing it. They're not gonna walk in and just follow the rules 
and they're not going to want to buy a cookie cutter approach to what's offered to them. They're going to want to create their own experience. And they don't want to do it for the sake of the beauty of the academic philosophy. They want it to be integrated with practical experience, whether that's internships, uh, a chance to participate in the kind of contests that I saw here, talked about here today by Hillary. Those kinds of things would very, be very, very attractive to pluralists as they imagine their college experience. Um, and of course, they want a job when they graduate because they've seen how difficult it can be. Some of them have older siblings who graduated from college and became unemployed. Um, obviously, some of those moved back in with them so they got to know them even better. Um, uh, but they want to make sure they get out of college and have a good job, which fortunately looks like the economy will be in a position to provide so long as you guys get them the skills and experience they need. So in that kind of environment, there becomes, you have to a new way of thinking about what college is. It's really an opportunity to create learning communities and introduce students into them. So that the, ta the idea and the activity of learning is not divorced from day to day, the rest of the day to day activities of the students. It's part of what they do. It's integrated with practical experience and it's a community. Very important, this generation Plurals are just as uh, interested in team and community and sharing as their millennial older siblings. And so, I'm sure this is happening already, faculty are in charge of designing that learning experience where you create an environment for learning, but you don't stand up and lecture for the class. A lot of people talk about flipped classrooms where the material is briefly covered, if at all, at class, mostly before class, and the class time is mostly spent in team projects. Millennials love it, pluralists will love it, because it's teaming. You will need to interject a little more notion of independence when the pluralists show up uh, and independent work. Uh, but they are the ones creating the learning experience for their peers. And the faculty's role is to guide that experience to make sure they pick up what they need to know and that experiential learning is obviously more powerful anyway. Now, how many of your faculty are capable of creating that? That's a whole other question we won't get into here. But literally, students will be wanting to co-design and co-instruct uh, their classroom activity, which I think is all to the good. Uh, and I'm sure many of you administrators uh, think it's all to the good. Whether the faculty thinks it's all to the good or not, we will see. From a technological perspective, we're going to be doing a lot of VAR, to Hillary's point. A lot of virtual reality, a lot of augmented reality. We're going to be using simulation and visual communication when we ask to determine, did you learn what you needed to learn? Have you mastered the skills we're looking for? We're already, of course, I'm sure you've seen students more willing to produce video than take a test. Uh, PowerPoint for sure than write a paper. Writing's a tough exercise. Um, and this is just the next step as the technologies make it possible to create literally the world that you're asking them to know and master. And by the way, that has implications for your campus. It's interesting that the Find It application app won the contest. You should actually be thinking about creating enough sensors in the physical environment for that app to work automatically. It shouldn't require a whole lot of smartphone human touch interaction. It should in fact be part of what the campus is, which is its own learning experience. The person who was kind enough to drive me by cart uh, through to, from the parking lot to here, took me through the forest. But that's all it was. I saw some cages, on an element. I saw some bamboo, I didn't see anything else. I should have, in the future I should have, experienced a rainforest as I went through it on my smartphone. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Now, you might want to start your work in this world 
by simply creating some Pokemon gyms or stops or something out there, lure the students to the right place. But if you think about Pokemon Go on a larger scale, notice that the Find It application introduced a treasure hunt uh, piece of it, which is all Pokemon Go is, but it's enabled by augmented reality in the physical world, changing the physical world through augmented reality to making it a game. And games are the best way for this generation and the next to learn. 83% of the people playing Pokemon Go are millennials, and all the rest are pluralists who are let out of the house by their parents. So, um, so that's where that world is going to, and you have to rethink how you think about your campus and its facilities. It's not how nice the classrooms are, it's how interactive the campus is. Okay, as you think about that challenge, let's talk about technology. This you probably understand even better. There is a misconception about millennials and their social media, which is their generation's communication technology, and plurals, and how they interact with social media. Uh, yes, more than half of them play video games at least one hour a day, but even more know someone who's a victim of online bullying or cyber stalking. And yes, they do a lot of shopping from their smartphone if they have the money, but only 15% would rather interact with friends using social media than face-to-face. -face. So there is this skepticism about the social media world involving concerns about security, concerns about safety, uh, and concerns about not getting enough uh, human interaction that this generation, both generations, are generally not acknowledged to have, but absolutely do when you talk to them and ask them about it. And millennials particularly worry about their young kids, their young, excuse me, siblings, uh, because they see what's happened in the world of social media and they want to make sure they protect their unknowing uh, younger siblings from it, but they both all share that skepticism. So security and safety is very high on their list. But it's clearly driven from the smartphone. I don't think I need to beat that one over the head. 87% um, say a smartphone uh, never leaves their side. These are 12 to 24 year olds, so it includes millennials and plurals. And 80% of them grab their smartphone when they wake up. Well, most of you probably do too. Okay, more importantly at the last one, uh, in the next five years, I believe everything will be done on mobile devices, 60%. They're right. The communication technology of my generation was radio. The communication technology of baby boomers was television. Uh, the communication technology of Xers was cable television. Those are all broadcast media. They have a different architecture than social media. Millennials gave us the popularity of social media from technologies that Xers put in place so they could be on their own. And those silly millennials adapted it so they could all be together all the time. Uh, but for uh, pluralists, that technology is all mobile, all smartphone. And that isn't as true, even though they're very good at it, as um, millennials, because it's not, you know, native. But that's, that's the communication technology of pluralists, mobile broadband internet on a smartphone. Um, and of course, they spend a lot of time taking pictures of it, and 44% uh, uh, take pictures at least once a day. You'd say, really, only 44%? Um, and 79% of them share it, because sharing is what these generations do. Sharing is crucial to their human interaction. They want as many people in their social group to know what they did and what they're doing as possible. And so our world of social media platforms is changing. Um, again, 12 to 24 year olds, the dark blue is uh, the year before, and the brighter green is the current year. Um, and you can see Facebook declining slightly in usage, Instagram growing, and this thing called Snapchat 
zooming ahead while Twitter falls a little bit by the wayside, even though you see a lot of Twitter usage in politics and entertainment and other kinds of uh, quick reaction kinds of environments, that's not really where the generations are headed. They're headed to uh, Snapchat and Instagram. And on the right hand, with the more brightly colored ones, uh, you can see when asked, the, the, the one on the left is usage, the two colors, and the multicolors are survey results. What is your most important social network? Instagram went, that little orange bar, from nothing to 32%. Twitter has fallen down. Facebook is dropping dramatically. Only 14% currently say it's your most important social network. And then this thing that didn't exist, it doesn't have orange or red bars, called Snapchat is already uh, racing past Facebook and on its way to being the most important uh, media platform. So all of that you can see is visual and smart photo oriented. But why is Snapchat growing faster than Instagram? Because in theory, it doesn't stay around. It is impermanent. It disappears. And so you go back to those security and safety concerns that the generation has and the media, social media platform that's addressing them is Snapchat saying, share, don't worry about it, it's gone. Your parents won't see it, your uh, employer won't see it. Whatever happens in the future, that's not gonna happen, it's gone. Uh, and so it's become extraordinarily popular People are trying to turn it into some of the branding activities on the right-hand side in the yellow. Uh, most of the stuff like Discover and Snapchat that, you are, that are generated from outside the group and are not sharing are not doing very well. But Snapchat itself is doing extraordinarily well and will continue to do so. So if you want to reach them, you better be on Snapchat. Okay, well, I've talked about this a little bit. I want to underline it in my final remarks before we take questions as it relates to the developing and evolution of learning management systems. So data sharing, I said, is a way of life. How many of you use Waze? So you all know that it's better because it's a team effort to figure out how to get past the 405 traffic. The middle one, I don't know that people would use Jawbone, but I'm sure you all use some kind of, not all, but many of you use some kind of fitness bracelet, right? And you share. You tell people how well you're doing. It's the basis of Weight Watchers, and it seems to work with exercise, too. And then there's Yelp, uh, which is a way of sharing information about the community you live in. Is, I think, is there a uh, CSUN-specific uh, app that's really Yelp? that share, everybody, all your students instantly use to check out what's going on in the community, not necessarily academically, but you know where to meet people and find them and where they are. There's, there's, there's an app out there that they're all using, right? You guys tell me what it is? Okay, that's that nature. So, so you got all that. Okay, and now in your head, data sharing is central to their way of life, sharing in particular. And then you think about the fact that learning has always been an inherently social experience. People learn because they learn with other people. And when it comes to millennials, they're moving from learning by listening to other people to learning by doing. Remember we talked about the pluralists wanting that practical experience in order to make education and learning as much fun as video games, said Bing Gordon, a member of the Interactive Arts Hall of Fame. And so now we have to think about what are the learning tools that can it successfully enable that kind of learning slash sharing? Well, you've already seen the end of encyclopedias. We all know about that. And when we were writing our first millennial book 10 years ago, this was a great and huge debate about whether Wikipedia was going to undermine the expertise in the world. What people didn't realize is expertise disappeared as a highly valued thing when millennials got into social media. Because instead of having somebody at the center of a broadcast media enterprise tell them what to 
watch, learn, or see at a specific time in a specific venue. Instead, you had social media in which everyone could tell you what to watch, what to learn, what to do at any time, on any device, anywhere. And so millennials grew up learning that wisdom is in the crowd and knowledge and experience is in the group and expertise is not outside from some central place, it's inside the world of sharing and learning. And with that went encyclopedias, faculty reputations, and a lot of other things. And we've also gotten rid of all those file cabinets, right? Everything's in some cloud somewhere with some device or some service. So both of those things make sharing of information so much easier. I want to tell you, if you haven't already figured it out, the textbooks are going to go away as well because they are so difficult to share. Um, California is one of the leaders in the implementation of open educational resources. This is a uh, system uh, sponsored in a great degree by the Hewlett Foundation that enables the creation of a, yes, an electronic textbook that doesn't need to be purchased, maybe $5 just to make sure you're a student, but is more importantly designed for the purpose of sharing. The five R's of OER is that you retain, you can make it, you can own your own copies, you can reuse them in a wide range of ways, there's no restrictions. You can revise them if you're a faculty member or for that matter a student co-instructing to the way you want them to be pre presented and you can mash them up. M uh, millennials favorite thing to do with music. You can do that with textbooks, remix them and most importantly, you're allowed by the OER license to redistribute them and share them with others. AB 798 passed by the California legislature last year created a huge grant application process for California campuses that undertake OER initiatives. Uh, by the way, plans for that grant money are due in September, uh, but it's a major attempt to take textbooks away from the cost of college and that's a motivation by those worried about the cost of college, but its popularity, which is growing by leaps and bounds, is not just over the cost, it's over the fact that they enable sharing of the fundamental core information for a given class. And there are now community colleges, I don't know that anyone's done it yet in California, but around the country, that offer something called ZTC degrees, zero cost textbooks. And every single class has OER text books, if you will, educational resources, and the, therefore students who sign up for that degree never pay a penny for their books. Okay, so I know this is on your minds. Let's talk about this and then go to questions. Learning management system that you're using or about to change or figure out here. Uh, how are you gonna find a learning management system today that's going to allow you to take on this continuous and increased amount of sharing by these generations in the future. There are three types of interactions that your current learning management system better be able to handle. One is between the learner and the content. Your learning management system should allow for the posting and access online of materials, lectures before and after the lecture, and multimedia materials. The learner instructor side of learning management systems should currently allow you to send and receive messages, have people turn in their assignments through it, and be received back the assignment with grades, and also allow the student to ask questions before or after the lecture about the material, and many of them also have been adapted to be able to do online exams as long as the security issue can be addressed and of course provide the ultimate grade announcement. Theoretically, your learning management system should be capable of doing most, if not all of those things today. And then of course, there's this learner-learner, peer learning activity, where students working together on a task or assignment can read or comment on each other's work, 
generate shared instructional materials, co-instruction, co-design, and their part, the, the learning management system, is considered useful by these student groups or teams. Don't know how much of your learning management system allows for that. It's a little bit cutting edge, almost now fading into got to have it. Well, here's what it needs to be able to do in the future. A little checklist for your learning management system investigations. On the learner content side, on the left in that gray dull picture is what is currently possible. On the right is what the new learning management system has to be capable of. It has to be capable of real-time updates and the group has to be able to edit it. Remember, go back to that create my custom experience in college and have the student do most of the teaching and learning with each other. From a learner instructor perspective, not only can, do assignments need to be posted, they need to be shareable with continuous Q&A. Not, not necessarily by the faculty member, but by the students in the class learning from each other, asking each other questions, the learning management system facilitating, getting them the answers they need, and also allow for the students to grade themselves and their team uh, in terms of what they've accomplished. Finally, your new learning management system on the learner-learner side should be all about social media. It's obviously got to be on smartphones. It's got to allow for co-creation because that's the future of colleges and learning in the, in the, as millennials and then their pluralist friends take over America. Uh, we got time for questions. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to sit down again. Thank you. So, we got mics. Do we have any questions? Just raise your hand. I'll get you a mic to come around. Whoever's going to handle the mics. Covered a lot of ground, and we got time. They don't have lunch ready anyway for uh, questions if you if you have them. All right. We have here a catch box for those who aren't familiar with it. It's a great tool for questions. I'm going to throw it to you, so whoever wears his hand or pass it to you, whichever you prefer, okay? Back in Dodger Stadium throwing peanut bags, okay. Do I need a mic? Oh, this, great, this is cool. Isn't that clever? Now, you see, that's, that's why you come to an IT conference, right? Because you'll never see this anywhere else. I was wondering if there's any, by the way, I really enjoy your talk. Thank you, Thank you. so much. I was wondering if there's any research on millennials who are parenting plurals, because I'm a millennial and I have a two-year-old, oh, and I'm good wondering for you. how the way I was raised is now disrupting so or the way there are, I'm raising There are 10,000 new millennial moms every day. That's an interesting stat. Your uh, two-year-old, are you headed for grit land? Have you thought about raising him to be capable of success despite facing difficulties? Yes. Him or her, I don't know which. All right, so here's what millennial moms are doing. And boy, is that a big topic in the commercial world. Um, first of all, they're not reading Dr. Spock to find out how to raise their kid, right? You can guarantee that. Instead, they're on mommy blogs. They're in social media sharing, asking each other, learning from each other, how to do the most challenging and difficult job any human being ever takes on, which is raising another human being. And they're extraordinarily harassed for time. She's nodding. You don't have time to raise this kid. Look at all the things I need to do, but I got to work. And, you know, the world is moving fast and I got to keep. So everything that is efficiently or is efficiency oriented for moms is extraordinarily appreciated by millennial moms. Anything that helps them get through the day, makes them more productive, scheduling, whatever, that's, that's the hot apps in the world of millennial moms. And then, of course, there's the general millennial belief that what we eat ought to be healthy. I don't know what that's about. And, um, <laughs> and that the products we use shouldn't destroy the environment. 
another strange concern. Um, and that's ex in really important in millennial mom land, which has caused all kinds of new brands to pop up and uh, change the way uh, uh, households think about the products they use. Do you use, uh, can you name a couple of brands that you're active in in the world of babies? Um, cleaning products, there's uh, Method is very popular. You can get it at Target. And <laughs> Target and shopping online is huge for the convenience. Yes, exactly. And why do you buy Method as opposed to some products made by Procter & Gamble? Well, they're better for the environment and that's There you go. There you go. <laughs> and people who realize that are making a fortune. Okay. So that's millennials and plurals and moms, and it's a wonderful t new topic of ours and our research, and I'm glad you asked the question. Others, on any aspect of generational impact or concern? Yes, I think you're allowed to ask a question. I'm not sure whether, we'll, whether that's okay for the president to ask. But. Um, so I have two kids. One is a Gen Xer and one is a Millennial. Do you see what a lot? Happens? Do you see a lot of difference? <laughs> what happens was her question. I think you've explained my son to me. Now. Yes. Well, which which is the son the the millennial? Yes. Yeah, and kind of different than the is the older one a daughter? Yes. Yeah, kind of different than the ex or daughter, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot of people read our books just to understand their kids. So um, <laughs> um, the issue is all of the independence and um, uh, sort of autonomous uh, autonomy desired by your daughter is the opposite of what your son wants. He wants to be part of a team, a group, a family. He wants to have lots of friends. Um, even, f even male millennials are worried about their friendship relationships. Not as much as females, but certainly to a greater degree than any other male we've seen. And your parenting style for, for him to be happy has to be extremely warm and smothering just the things you, your daughter pushed back against. And uh, good luck. <laughs> By the way, they won't get along together. For, forget that idea. The two kids aren't gonna get along. Uh, in the workplace, the single biggest degree of friction is between Xers and millennials. Xers usually the boss as the millennial enters the workplace, and um, the Xers finally has their chance to get revenge on the millennials <laughs> for all the loving they got growing up that the Xer never got. So it's pretty hard to manage your way through that, and and it'll you'll see a lot of their rivalry about their mother's attention also fall into that underlying debate. Okay. That's great questions. Yes, right next there. Um, so I've got a question kind of about the media and how the media is going to change. Uh, because, of course, the youth of today is very much affected by the media, which is actually controlled by a very different generation. Yes. Um, do you see any kind of a change as far as maybe stopping all of the, the concerns that, oh, my gosh, something's going to happen to you as soon as you walk out of your house? Um, are the future generations, when they start to take over these kinds of uh, positions, are they going to possibly bring a more positive spin to it? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> the dark days of America, um, the concerns about don't play outside, somebody's going to drive by in a car, grab you, I'll never see you again, uh, and you'll be sold into slavery. Um, uh, those concerns will go away when the people choosing the stories are millennials. Right now, the storylines are still being determined mostly by Xers, including the advertising, and in some remaining cases by boomers. And, and, and they're, still, they're still talking to the younger generations as if those younger generations are who they were when they were young, when in fact that young generation is nothing like who they were when they were young. Just watch your daughter and son. And so it's all askew. And then Hollywood, which has its own historical challenges with change, um, continues, as I mentioned earlier, to try and revive 
X or plots, which never work. But they never notice that the cartoon animated world, right? And particularly Disney, which is a genius about millennials, the only part of Hollywood that understands millennials, studied them to death. They're making all the money. That's what all the number one, unless it's an action film, all, everything else is all millennial lovely stories, right? Where, you know, Zootopia, the world has evolved to perfection. Prey and Predator are now living in harmony together. And I don't want to spoil the movie for you, but the plot is about some evil person who's reintroduced predator tendencies into some of the population of Zootopia. And of course, that person turns out to be the local city official. Okay, so there goes <laughs> politics. Back there, catches. So I know we don't have a lot of time, but I was curious in your surveys that you did, did you notice differences with uh, generations of color, LGBTQ? Sure. And if you can talk a little bit about some of those differences. So when we wrote our first book and went out and talked about it, it was a very optimistic book about the future of America, and we published it in 2008. We wrote about why Barack Obama was going to be elected president, and we wrote the book. Nobody even knew who Barack Obama was. Um, I would get this question all the time. We don't get it quite so much anymore, which is, well, aren't you just writing about white middle-class kids when you're writing about millennials and how wonderful they are? Our answer was, well, actually, in the survey research, the best kids, and certainly the most optimistic kids, were kids of color. Because Hispanic kids and African American kids, when asked about how their future will compare to the future they grew up in, they're the ones who say it's going to be better. And it's among the white community that you find people say, oh, no, I don't know how it's going to come out, right? So I haven't done LGBTQ enough to know the answer, but I'm sure, given the progress of the last couple of years, that you would find the same phenomenon, where the people who have benefited most from the increasing demand for a tolerant society are most optimistic about the future of that society. And I, I think that's what the da data would show on that. But it's very, very evident in, in communities of color. And by the way, those communities are also the highest u percentage users of social media and, uh, and uh, smartphone devices. Uh, quite the opposite of what people thought. We well, this terrible digital divide. Well, actually, the divide is somewhere else, but it isn't along lines of color. Somebody else? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Um, please. Uh, can, can you comment possibly on the uh, arc or the evolution of marketing toward <laughs> the pluralistic generation? Understanding that you know, uh, current folks running marketing companies right now are still Gen X or baby boomers and still have this very beat you about the head with our branding and messaging. Um, so where do you see that changing with the understanding that millennials are uh, un untrusted or untrustworthy of, of branding and marketing? And uh, how do you see that evolving? So um, moment for bragging. Last year, we, I was, we were named, my co-author and I were named one of the top 25 marketers uh, in the country for our lectures to marketing folks. And we always start when talking to a group of ad executives by saying, oh, aren't you lucky? You get to hear another lecture about those damn millennials, right? Because they're all lectures and they all can't stand the fact that the only thing their advertisers want to do is reach millennial markets, right? And, um, and then we, sort of help them out through some of this stuff. And then we tell them a story about how you could do something with your brand that would attract millennials if you were truly creative. And we don't make it up. It's something that somebody actually tried and um, was just a little ahead of their time based upon the success of Pokemon Go. But this one was something called uh, The Conspiracy for Good. And it was a augmented reality smartphone game. It was actually created by Nokia, and you know, understand how far back that was. And um, what it was is a story uh, that you could follow if you downloaded the app 
about uh, people seeking to build libraries in Africa who were being thwarted by an oil company that wanted to use the land for their pipeline. And the episodes enabled you to donate real donations to real potential African libraries as you succeeded in the game and follow along. And then if you were really good at the game, you were selected, I don't know whether they, it was two dozen or so people, where they flew you to London for the culmination of the game, which was a press conference being held by the oil company executives to announce their successful acquisition of the land rights that would allow their pipeline to go through without ever mentioning that the libraries would therefore no longer exist or wouldn't be capable of being built. And when you landed in London, the clues to finding the press conference, disrupting it, making the public aware of the real situation, were presented to you in augmented reality from your cell smartphone. And you interacted with real people as you went around doing this. People who were hired by the creators of Conspiracy for Good. So you ran into news reporters, you ran into street musicians, you ran into all kinds, who were in on the game. And then of course at the end, if you played the game successfully, which thankfully they did, uh, you know, the pipeline was killed, the, pre the government announced it was retracting the rights, et cetera, et cetera. They raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for real libraries in Africa that were built. And they created an entire community all around what was basically a treasure hunt. And then nothing happened. They had this enormous success, but nobody wanted, could figure out how to take a, that and create the brand reputation with millennials that is the holy grail of marketing. So that's why we always share it with them. Now we can tell them, look, it was Pokemon Go five years ago. Here's how it worked. Now just add your brand, create the lure, and, and off we go. So that's what we tell them. Forget television. Forget all the printed media. Your distribution has to be social media oriented. It has to be team sharing. It has to involve doing something good to change the world for the better together, which is what millennials are about. And if you can do that and stick your brand in the middle of it, you'll be okay. And if you don't do that, we won't know who your brand is in a few years. That's what we're talking about. Yes. You have, two, you have time for two, one or two. Well, I got, we, we got it, we'll do you, and then we'll do the newest trustee for the Cal, Cal State University. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you um, about um, the global implications of that, because you've talked mostly about the United States or the English-speaking world. Um, how does the millen the how do those last generations, the millennial and the plural, play out on a global scale? Because they, we are in a global world, and right. they have to interact with p other people. And uh, th these generations in other countries are probably bigger than in our country. Well, certainly in most of the Middle East, the young generation, the under 30 generation is half the population, uh, and so therefore proportionally bigger. Um, the challenge of generational theory around the world is first of all, the creators of it only did English speaking peoples and they took their first book, Generations, said it was the history of the English speaking people from uh, 1500 to 2050, and of course they wrote it in 1990. Um, and so they were very, very focused on finding these patterns in that culture and that history. Since then, they and others, and we and two, have examined whether the generational cycle exists, and if so, in what pattern or style in other cultures and therefore other countries. Um, it, to some degree, is a matter of timing. For instance, in the English-speaking neighbor to our north in Canada, they are pretty much in sync, maybe two years behind like on everything else, but pretty much in sync. Just a joke for you Canadians. Um, however, in Europe, not English speaking, uh, you have the impact of World War II, which wiped out an entire generation. In our situation, the generational wipeout occurred at the Civil War. But in Europe, you have World War II and the Great War before it. 
And so they're close within five years of the cycle, and the cycle seems to be of the same type, but it's not quite the same. There are names, which I don't remember now, for these generations in those countries, in German and Fran French and so forth. Um, but they tend to appear about four or five years after the generational shift has occurred in English-speaking countries. The one to think about hard, however, is China, which had no generational change until the communist revolution. That was a society, you need modernity to have generational change because it was a society that, you, that raised its kids the same way every single time, right? And for eons. And so nothing happened. And then you got this huge turmoil, the long march, the establishment of communism. Um, and ever since then, we've had rapid generational cycles in China. They don't match our, they match the, the cycle, the type of generation, they don't match the timing. Um, but, you know, Deng Xiaoping was the uh, adaptive leader of, of China's generation that came along and said, well, communism doesn't necessarily mean everything. You can have your plot and whatever. And then the generation of what the Chinese call little emperors, the result of their one child policy, right? Is very, has attitudes and beliefs that are very similar to millennials in terms of patriotism and, and, uh, and the parents smothering the kid because the only one they'll ever have and the kid thinking they can do anything. And, um, and so there's that. But that's not who's growing up in China today. Some of those little emperors are now coming into their power and relying upon their uh, generational descendancy of the revolution to take that power, and they got in a lot of trouble. You know, they crashed Ferraris with girlfriends in the car, and they were supposed to be looking out for the people, and so now you have a leader who's reacting against that kind of millennial behavior and using it for other political purposes. So China is definitely seeing generational change. Doesn't line up with ours, does line up with cycles. One of the dangers in international uh, history is when you have very um, militaristic, belligerent, uh, chauvinistic leaders coming into contact with each other. And that's true of boomers' leadership interacting around the world. Won't name names. And, um, and whether the difference in generational change in China will help us get through that is still unknown. So with that foreboding comment, would you care to make your, ask your question and we'll go to lunch? Don't forget to introduce yourself for those who don't know you. <laughs> introduce Hi. yourself. Hi, my name is George Reyes and I am the new student trustee, so thank you. <laughs> My question is, how can we help faculty, current faculty, mm. uh, get into the thinking of millennials and pluralist education? So more group structure collaboration, class structure, and more technology in the classroom. Well, first of all, you ought to have the trustees pass a resolution mandating it. <laughs> Second, uh, given the nature of faculty independence and freedom, I uh, haven't read my book. Um, any one of the three will do. Um, uh, and then, I guess third, the students have to take responsibility. They have to make it clear their expectations in your st student feedback. I assume you do it of faculty. Don't give the guy who's still standing up there lecturing, reading his notes from a textbook he wrote, ever get a good grade, right? They just, and then that feedback will come up but you don't have to be vindictive about it. You can say at the beginning of the class. So, we understand we're here to learn X. Can you tell us something about your learning style and how you plan on having us learn this? And then engage in a nice dialogue about how you might want to do some of those things by way of teaming and collaboration and in-class work and so forth. And good luck with all that. Uh, um, <laughs> but if you, don't, if you don't take responsibility for it, it'll never happen. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.